My name is Phaedra Aldridge. Welcome to Look Again, Mental Illness Reexamined, a podcast about mental illness brought to you by the BC Schizophrenia Society and our BC partner organizations. Schizophrenia, it's neither new nor rare. And in fact, it's been around for centuries and yet we still have a long way to go in understanding it. I find it so fascinating that at points in our history, schizophrenia was thought to be due to a spiritual affliction or some kind of moral deviance. But of course now, we know it's a brain disorder. And yet, despite being around for such a long time, virtually all we know about schizophrenia has been learned in the past 200 years, and mostly in the latter parts of the 20th and 21st centuries. So how did schizophrenia evolve through the ages and the different cultures? And how did it become associated with multiple personality disorder? It's a historical journey that I think will surprise you. And here to take us on that journey is Dr. Adrian Preda, a psychiatrist and professor at the University of California at the Irvine Medical Center in the School of Medicine. He wrote an article about the historical to present day concepts of schizophrenia and his clinical work and his research focuses on schizophrenia and other psychotic and cognitive disorders. Dr. Preda, we are delighted to have you here today. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, you wrote an article called The Schizophrenia Concept Timeline Highlights. And in your article, you go through the history of schizophrenia. And at the start of that article, you get into the concept of schizophrenia versus schizophrenias. Tell us about that. Be happy to. Maybe we can take the, this a little bit farther back. So schizophrenia actually is a term made its first occurrence in the literature in the beginning of the 20th century. The term was coined by a Swiss psychiatrist by the name of Eugen Bloiler. But what he named schizophrenia was a cluster of behaviors and psychological symptoms that were actually described before Bloiler uh, under a different name. It's not clear if schizophrenia has been around forever. That's actually a debate. First mentioned in the literature is in the 18th century, and it's not clear if before it wasn't mentioned because people were not keen about observing this type of manifestations, or before the 18th century, all severe mental illness was brought together under this big umbrella term of insanity, of madness. But towards the middle of the 18th century, people started to be a bit keener about differentiating the different types of mental problems. And first, a French psychiatrist by the name of Benedict Morel described a series of cases which he named demence precoce, which in French means early dementia. Now, Morel was referring to people who were young, men and women, who seemed to have what he described as clinical presentation significant for thought process disorganization and significant cognitive deficits, what we would mean by a dementia type of disorder today. And Morel had no intention of creating a new diagnosis. He just used the term to describe a series of patients that he observed in his hospital. Later on, a German psychiatrist used the term of dementia precoce for another few patients that seem to meet criteria for what we mean today by schizophrenia. Kreplin came on the scene. He was a preeminent German psychiatrist at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. And Kreplin had this revolutionary idea about actually charting the course of psychiatric problems, mental issues over long periods of time. And he pretty much noticed that there are two courses that characterized many of the patients that he saw. There was a type of psychiatric disorder that seemed to have a chronic gradual course, and there was another type of psychiatric disorders that seemed to have more of a cyclical, episodic course. So let me guess, schizophrenia and bipolar? You're absolutely right. That is so fascinating. I would love to hear who is credited with coining the term schizophrenia, and in what year did that happen? Yes, the, the term actually was coined by Bloiler. That was in 1908. The origin of the words are two Greek words. One is schizain, which means splitting, and phrenos means mind in ancient Greek. So Bloiler took the dementia precox cluster of symptoms 
And he decided to change the name because first he was not as impressed as Kraplin was by the uh, chronic deteriorating course. He actually thought that some patients are not going to be chronic and more of an optimistic formulation is that some people could actually recover. The other contribution that he had was that he was trying to, to have uh, more of a psychological understanding of what led to the disorder, which Kraplin did not. Kraplin was more of an observer. He was uh, really kind of describing things and he had no pretense towards a psychological explanation of things. They lived in two different periods. Kreplin was living in a time when psychiatry was becoming very biological. Everybody would have their brain dissected when they would die in one of the psychiatric hospitals. Loyler lived in a time when psychoanalysis was up and coming, so there was a lot of interest in psychological formulations. And Bloiler thought that actually the essential problem in schizophrenia is a splitting of the different mental functions. So that's obviously where the multiple personality, I assume, where that idea comes from. So maybe we can get into a little bit about that because that's still talked about a lot and people still associate schizophrenia with the concept of a split personality or multiple personality. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Dissociative identity disorder is a completely different set of disorder than schizophrenia and psychosis. So there is no relationship with regards to even the symptoms or the course over time responses to treatment for multiple personality disorder. It's actually not even thought to be a personality disorder. It's interesting. It was in and out of broader cluster of anxiety disorders and dissociative disorders. So very, very different sort of pathological, pathophysiological formulation, different recommendations with regards to treatment and different course over time. Now there is this popular psychology idea of a splitted personality, right? It goes back to Dr. Jekyll and Hyde, right? That was kind of the romantic psychology formulation back in the day when people could have very different aspects of their personalities. And by the way, some of that played into Bloyer's formulation of schizophrenia. He thought that the problem was a disconnect between people's personality, mental function, not splitted personality, but he thought of the psychology of the mind as being a composite of a variety of functions, emotional functions, cognitive functions, and then personality functions. And what he thought the problem was that these different compartments of the mind were actually not communicating with one another. They were splitted. So there was a splitted mind as opposed to a splitted personality. Interesting. Huh, that is so fascinating. Now, at the start of your article, you talk about the idea of schizophrenia versus schizophrenia so plural. Yes. I would love to hear your thoughts as to where the concept of multiple schizophrenia or plural schizophrenia came from. The concept of mental illness, as we discussed, was this big homogeneous type of a thing, right? So it was the concept of what we now call unitary psychosis. So a basic sort of fundamental psychological problem that would have a variety of manifestations, but in a sense, it was one thing. In other words, we are looking in the early days, looking at lumping hypotheses of mental disorders. When Kreplin came initially, he was what we would call now a splitter because he differentiated then manic depression from what later on them to be schizophrenia. Within his dementia precox clusters, he also had a number of different diagnoses. So his initial formulations, he, he actually presented his concept of schizophrenia through a number of his textbook for, for medical students, the, the lectures that he was giving in, in the medical school. And his, his conceptualization of dementia precox changed over time. He started by being really a very astute splitter, right? Describing minute differences between all these different diagnostic categories. So different things with different courses, different prognosis, not different responses to treatments because the treatments were very rudimentary back then. Towards the end of his life, interestingly enough, Kreplin changed his formulation and became more of a lumper. So sorry, I have to jump in here. So lumper versus splitter, is that the term? you're using? It's a term that's been used, actually. So in, in the diagnostic classification, there is always a spectrum between lumping and splitting. So somebody is known as a lumper? <laughs> yes. I don't know if that's a term I'd want to be known for. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? So yes, we have the lumping or splitting classifications of mental disorders. And that's something that in the history of psychiatric classification, the pendulum has swung one way or another. So looking at the history of the concept, then Bloiler, he was a more of a schizophrenia is one thing. And then he described different type of symptoms, primary versus secondary symptoms. So actually Bloiler was 
somewhere maybe in the middle on this question between is it one or is it many. And this tension between one schizophrenia versus many schizophrenia has actually been reflected in the different editions of, of DSM. I find it interesting that the term schizophrenia really has only been around for approximately 100 years. That's not that long. I would be very interested to hear your thoughts on treatment, where we were before, as far back Middle Ages, to where we are today. And I know that's a big question. <laughs> right. So should we lump or should we split? <laughs> Yeah. And me being the lumper. <laughs> I love that term. <laughs> so one of the things that's important to understand is that really before the days of modern medicine and then modern psychiatry, mental disorders for the longest time were thought as afflictions that were sent by gods or a demonic possession. There was this kind of religious formulation that kind of implied that something was really, in a way, morally wrong with that person. And obviously, the recommendation for treatment was atonement. And people were supposed to be isolated for not only their own good, but the good of society of large. So that the treatment was actually interning people in an asylum. There was no clear biological intervention. There are some mention in the very preliminary textbook that were written by alienists about scaring somebody out of their wits, which is kind of interesting idea. It's the idea of a shock type of an intervention, which could sometimes bring people back to their senses. The idea of throwing somebody in a cold iced bucket, it was a shocking of the system that would somehow restore them to sanity. And there was no clear explanation for that. And some of that explains the very, really barbaric treatments that have been perpetuated in the history of psychiatry. And part of it was that there was some evidence that maybe that might work for some, so then why not offer it to many? And obviously that was not effective and dangerous and out of like lack of anything that was thought as better than nothing, right? Coming to the 19th century, there was some attempt to medicate people with severe mental disorders, nothing specific for schizophrenia, but Kraplin was using bromides and opium for his patients. So there are substances that were known to have a calming effect. The idea there was move somebody towards tranquility as opposed to treating symptoms. People were agitated and that was a way of calming the system with very rudimentary chemical type of interventions. The beginning of the 20th century, uh, psychiatry was actually very biological back then. It's interesting. So a number of shock type of treatment, but shock treatment, not in the electrical shock that was preceding what's now electroconvulsive therapy. Physicians were trying insulin shocks or medrazole shocks, inducing a high fever, which would result in a hypoglycemic coma. Very dangerous treatments, right, with a high risk for mortality. But when people would come out of that state, they would be better. The reason for the shock therapy as a concept actually went back to a clinical observation that people who had epilepsy had a very low risk of uh, schizophrenia, and people who had schizophrenia would almost never have seizures. So the field was moving from offering nothing to offering something. That being said, that interventions resulted in increased high rates of mortality. People could die. You're listening to Look Again, Mental Illness Reexamined, a podcast brought to you by the BC Schizophrenia Society and BC Partner Organizations. I'm your host, Phaedra Aldridge. This podcast would not be possible without the support of the community. From the bottom of our hearts, we want to thank you for caring about serious mental illness and everything that's around it. Together, we truly can make a difference. Welcome back to Look Again, Mental Illness Reexamined. In this episode, we're taking a historical journey with Dr. Adrian Preda and discovering not only when some of the key concepts of schizophrenia occurred, but also their background. In your article, you touch upon the changes that happened in the demographics of the disease in the 1960s and the 1970s. I quote from your article, The disease shifted from an illness of mostly white middle-class women to an illness of urban black males. This shift obviously has had major impacts on political events. It would have played out in how the illness is conceptualized by the general public. That's a big difference to go from white middle-class women to urban black males. I would be very interested to hear your thoughts why that transition happened 
What impact do you think that's had on how schizophrenia is viewed today? There's an amazing book actually written by this psychiatrist by the name of Metzl, which is called Protest Psychosis. And what Metzl did, he went through many years of records in, in a state hospital and he noticed during the 60s and the 70s, the patient demographics change from white to African-American. And as medications were coming, the white people were discharged, the black people were not. And even more interesting, at some point, the state hospital changed to a legal type of facility, to a prison, and the black patients became black prisoners. Now, we need to understand that this was during the times when there was the whole movement for racial justice and society was splitted. So going back to the concept of splitting, some psychiatrists saw black men being at risk for splitting because they were forced to live in two worlds at the same time. A black ward would have very different values than a white ward. So the black men were specifically at risk because they would work, right? A black woman would be at home, so it would be more in the black environment, less subject to splitting. But the black man would be split between these two worlds, therefore at risk for this disorder, which was schizophrenia. The other part is that obviously there was a lot of civil unrest and other psychiatrists were observing that people who would be involved with movements or subversive movements or secret societies were at risk for paranoia. It's kind of adaptive to be paranoid if you are going to be part of a secret society. But being in a paranoid note, the argument was made, would increase the risk for a paranoid type of a disorder. And there you go, schizophrenia all over again. What's interesting is that we always see what we want to see, and then everything can be explained. It's hard to make the argument the psychiatrists were all just racially motivated. What was happening is that there was a really inconscient bias in terms of associating some of these things with pathology. That's a problem that we face in psychiatry in general, right? So here is what the data shows. There is a correlate of schizophrenia with the lower socioeconomic strata, with poverty, with urban living, with lack of education. And the question is, is that a cause or is that an effect of schizophrenia? Cause meaning that people living in less privileged environments are at higher risk for stress. And the stress will eventually become toxic and the risk for schizophrenia could be increased. That's one formulation. The other formulation is that schizophrenia would lead in a significant ability to function. That's what's called the drift downwards hypothesis, where you start from a higher level, but you are not going to be able to maintain that level. So people with schizophrenia will not be able to complete knowledge because psychosis kind of, you know, starts in the late teens, early 20s. So you could have a very good life trajectory before schizophrenia hits. But then you cannot complete college, you cannot maintain employment, you're going to face financial stress. How do you think history has impacted our views of schizophrenia today? What I hear you asking is that schizophrenia, through all these different formulations, has been a very stigmatizing diagnosis. And that's correct, it has. I think all this history, what surfaced more has been the negative impact of schizophrenia on someone's life. Being diagnosed with schizophrenia is a terrible thing by patients and to some extent by doctors. And that's why maybe there is a reluctance to even give the diagnosis to the patient because you don't want to get it wrong. Because how is that going to impact their view of themselves? And while there are some parts of the history that obviously we need to think about the bad and the good, there are many parts of the history that somehow have not made it to the present. I think what made it to the present was this sort of fatalistic, stigmatizing understanding of what schizophrenia is. What did not make it to the present is that there are patients who are getting better. And that's been discussed through the different reiterations of the diagnostic formulations. How do you think we as a society can start to address some of those many myths and misconceptions that still exist today? So we are asking about new directions and stigma. Two countries. Japan and Korea, they no longer talk about schizophrenia. The diagnosis was changed from schizophrenia. In Japan now, it's called integration disorder. In Korea, the new nomenclature calls schizophrenia attunement. And the reason for the change, you, you'd wonder, you know, is this just semantics? I, mean, does it I was make just going to ask that. Is it semantics? Are they just changed? Yeah. <laughs> and well, you know, the studies that have been published on this show that the change of schizophrenia to your point is a label that has very stigmatizing correlates. That's just the way it is. I mean, with everything that we know, it's really hard to get rid of that baggage. So the idea was, well, we have a very heavy label here. How about switching labels? Is that going to make a difference? 
And it seems like in Japan it did. So it's been less stigmatizing. There are a number of studies showing that people have an easier time going to doctors, talking about the symptoms, being comfortable with the treatments. But doesn't that just mean we're just changing the labels, though? But the studies show actually that we don't, because the new label is maybe just the new kid on the block. There is less stigma and there is better access to treatment. And the same kind of trend has been reported in Korea with this change in to attunement disorder. It's going to be very interesting to see what effects it has if in future years it's going to have all the stigma and myths and, and baggage, to use your term. Dr. Preda, thank you so much for joining me today. You took us on a very interesting historical journey, and there's so much left I want to talk about. So thank you so much for being here today. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. And a huge thank you to you, our audience, for joining us for this episode. Together, we can change the narrative around mental illnesses like schizophrenia and the many myths and the stereotypes that still exist today. If you have any questions or any comments about today's show, tweet us at BC Schizophrenia. And to get our latest episode, be sure to hit follow on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere you listen to podcasts. We hope you join us next episode. Talk to you soon. This podcast is brought to you by the BC Schizophrenia Society and the BC Partners for Mental Health and Substance Use Information. We're a group of nonprofit agencies providing good quality information to help individuals and families maintain or improve their mental well being. The BC Partners members are Anxiety Canada, BC Schizophrenia Society, Canadian Institute for Substance Use Research, Canadian Mental Health Association's BC Division, Family Smart, Jesse's Legacy, the North Shore Family Services Program, and Mood Disorders Association of BC, a branch of Lookout Housing and Health Society. The BC Partners are funded and stewarded by BC Mental Health and Substance Use Services, an agency of the Provincial Health Services Authority. For more information, visit heretohelp.bc.ca.